Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Renu Bakshi, and joining us today is Dr. Jennifer Gardy, a renowned scientist and author, a TED conference speaker, and an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia's School of Population and Public Health. Dr. Gardy, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. We're talking today about a topic that's being discussed all around the world, Ebola and pandemics. Uh, it's the worst Ebola outbreak on record. The World Health Organization says 5,000 people have died so far, and in a couple of months, a million people could be infected. The question on many minds is, are we at risk in North America? We are at very, very low risk of Ebola in North America. And the reason for this is when it comes to infectious diseases, risk is really a function of two things. First of all, it's a function of the danger inherent in the pathogen itself. And that's not going to change anywhere. You know, an Ebola virus in West Africa is the same in terms of transmissibility, in terms of the disease it will cause, as an Ebola virus in New York City. But the other part of the risk equation is vulnerability. How vulnerable? is the population in which that pathogen is spreading. And with Ebola, that's really where you see the differences between the risk in West Africa and the risk here in North America. But then when you look at West Africa, it's very, very under-resourced. You don't have, uh, you know, basic disinfection or infection control practices in place in a lot of these um, sort of impromptu care centers that have been set up. It's difficult to get information out to the population. You've already got a vulnerable population where there aren't a lot of doctors in the country to begin with. There's not a lot of health care infrastructure. You've got a very densely packed population. All of those factors really combine to make West Africa quite a vulnerable spot and combine to make North America a fairly resilient spot. And that's really why you see the differences. And those are indeed playing out. You know, we've seen uh, a couple of cases of Ebola now imported to North America, people that have either developed it in North America or have been airlifted out of West Africa for treatment. We only saw two onward transmissions of Ebola in well-prepared North American centers, whereas one single case back in December 2013 in Guinea led to these tens and tens of thousands of cases that we're seeing now. Why so much hype? That's a great question, uh, and I think it does track back to elements of risk. Again, uh, you see hype when people are confronted with risks that are unfamiliar and uncontrollable risk. The public just gets interested in it. Do you think that the medical community contributes to that hype? The medical community, not so much. I think where you have communication issues is when you see political will at odds with medical evidence. A uh, great example of this was in uh, the northeastern United States when a couple of state governors decided they wanted to impose a mandatory quarantine on individuals that were returning from Ebola-affected areas in West Africa. And there's no medical basis for this. In those situations, the public gets mixed messages. They're getting one message from the professionals and they're getting another message from their political leaders. So do you think that conflict uh, is enhanced when travel restrictions are imposed by countries like the U.S., Canada, and Australia? The thing with travel bans, with mandatory quarantine, is there is no medical evidence that they do any good at preventing Ebola, but there is evidence that they do substantial harm. And a really good example of this is if you uh, circle back to 2003 and the SARS pandemic and what happened in Toronto, you had a single infectious case that led to a about 250 other cases. And this was a virus that transmits in much the same way that the flu does. It's a lot easier to catch than Ebola. And the WHO, World Health Organization at the time, issued a travel advisory for Toronto. What happened in the wake of that, even though it was a very short-lived, I think it was about three weeks in total, that cost Toronto's economy over a billion dollars. And we have no evidence that it actually did anything to attenuate transmission of SARS. So you've got economic impacts associated with travel bans. And in West Africa, which is already destabilized just by you know, the, the occurrence of this particular outbreak, a travel ban on top of that is really going to hamper uh, their recovery efforts. I really think that they do more harm than good and that there's no evidence to say that it decreases the risk of Ebola. So where are these diseases coming from? 
Well, when it comes to what we call the emerging infectious diseases, the brand new ones, a lot of them are really coming out of wildlife reservoirs, animal reservoirs, and it's really due to our changing land use as humans. So Ebola, for example, emerged in 1976. Its natural reservoir seems to be bats, and it jumps into an intermediary host, which would be a primate, a gorilla or monkey, for example. SARS in two, uh, 2003, again, bats is a na uh, natural reservoir. Then jumping into wild cats, these civet cats that were sold at markets, a Nipah virus in the late 90s in Malaysia. Bats is the reservoir. You can usually blame bats when it's, when it's an infectious disease. Bats were the reservoir, uh, jumped into pigs and then into humans. So as humans change how we interact with our planet, as we encroach deeper and deeper into previously uninhabited, forested regions, and as we introduce our animals into those regions, you know, we might chop down a bunch of trees in the Malaysian forest and suddenly start raising pigs, we're exposed to all of the viruses, all of the bacteria, all the new diseases that are carried in uh, bats, in other species that are present in that jungle that can now jump into those intermediary species and do what we call spillover into the human population. So uh, people shouldn't fear, but there should be a healthy dose of concern. Mm -hmm. What are the health risks that we should really be worried about? Uh, well, definitely the, the big three, things like cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. I mean, when you combine all of those, those kill two thirds of North Americans. Yet, you know, going back to the idea of risk and, and what risks people get concerned about, I find it ironic when somebody comes to ask me for advice about Ebola and they say, you know, is this something I should be worried about? Meanwhile, they've got, you know, a 20 ounce, uh, coffee covered in whipped cream and filled with sugar syrup in their hand. It's like, wait a second here, your priorities are a little misplaced here. So I think we should be worried about those. In terms of infectious diseases, uh, really influenza and pneumonia are still a huge concern. About one in 50 deaths every year can be traced back to flu or to pneumonia. And in the case of flu, we do have a vaccine that can reduce your chances of getting the flu every year. So are vaccines the solution to infectious disease in your mind? Vaccines can be a solution, but the problem with vaccines is in order to uh, develop them, it takes a very, very long time. There are many diseases that we've been dealing with and studying for decades that we don't have an effective vaccine for. So if we have a vaccine, great, but we also have to be prepared for not having a vaccine. And our best hope to prevent the next pandemic, to prevent the next big Ebola outbreak like this, is going to be information. It's going to be data. I think one of the reasons this outbreak got out of control is because it happened at the intersection of three countries' borders. Those countries weren't talking to each other, and they weren't talking to the WHO, and the WHO wasn't talking to the world. So you had a breakdown of information sharing. So I think if we can open up data, open up surveillance efforts, come up with new ways of looking for disease, next time something like this happens, we're going to be able to circle the wagons a lot faster and contain the, you know, the next Ebola outbreak at a couple hundred cases instead of tens of thousands of cases. So what sanitation was to the 19th century, what antibiotics were to the 20th century, I really believe that data will be the panacea for pandemics of the 21st century. Dr. Jennifer Gardy, thanks. That's a lot of uh, good insight Thank into you. Ebola and pandemics. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. If you'd like to continue the conversation or support the opinion, leave a comment on the link below. Thank you for joining us. I'm Renu Bakshi for Spotlight.